as your track leads for Track F, it's been wonderful to see the progress that you all have made thus far. Uh, for a brief context, this has been um, the latest in a series of hackathons that we've had, starting with the Ideathon, then into Beat the Pandemic 1, moving on to Africa, then Datathon, switching into Beat the Pandemic 2, and most recently, Latin America. Uh, generally, these hackathons have been focused on trying to get people together from around the world, from a diverse set of skills and backgrounds to tackle pressing problems related to COVID-19. So here we are for India turning the tide COVID-19. Can we go to the next slide? Great, so in this track in particular, we're looking at how can we strengthen coordination across healthcare institutions, both public and private. This is a pressing and time sensitive need to facilitate information throughout. So we've listed a few questions initially that we posed to you all, such as how can we collaborate to build more integrated systems? How can we help healthcare facilities track the availability of resources such as beds and communicate information among public and private institutions? How do we take advantage of available data to plan for surge capacity and potentially convert facilities into COVID-19 care facilities? And finally, how can we uh, bring together the government and private hospitals to coordinate costs of care for COVID-19 patients with more transparency and efficacy? These are again, just a sample of the questions that we had started out with, um, but I think a good place to start us out and we'll sort of see how that evolves as we go to our teams. So next, uh, I have the privilege of introducing our judges to you all. Uh, first, we have Dr. Anil Purohit, who's the founder and CEO of Jodhpur School of Public Health in Jodhpur. He's involved in a variety of academic and public health institutions globally, with more than 25 years of experience in establishing more than 44 public health, AIDS, IVF, stem cells, and clinical research training, counseling, and education programs globally across Africa, Asia Pacific, Europe, West Indies, and the USA. Welcome, Dr. Prohit. Thank you, Matt. Next, we have Dr. Bob Bollinger, who's a professor of infectious disease, public health, and nursing at Johns Hopkins University. He's worked with colleagues on a variety of issues across India, including infectious disease research and education projects for the last 40 years. Welcome, Dr. Bollinger. Thank you, Matt. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Rao was unable to make it due to a last minute uh, personal emergency, but he sends his regards and looks forward to supporting you all as we continue from this hackathon. Next, I have the privilege of introducing you to Dr. Rathi Godridge, who's a graduate of the UCLA uh, School of Medicine in, in Los Angeles. She's a physician certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine who currently lives in Mumbai. She focuses on improving a variety of public health initiatives in India and is an active member of the Executive Council Board for the Public Health Foundation of India and New Delhi, and also a member of the T.H. Chan School of Public Health Research Center in Mumbai. She's a member of the business family of the Godridge Industries Group and the and as a physician, she's particularly interested in improving and implementing programs in the workplace to improve mental health, physical health, and well-being of all employees. Welcome, Dr. Godrich. Awesome. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Ms. Niharika Barak Singh, who joined the Indian Administrative Service in 1997. She belongs to the state of Odisha where she completed her school and college before joining JNU for her master's in sociology. She's worked in the government of India as the director for the Department of Economic Affairs, Ministry of Finance, and Joint Secretary, Department of Food and Public Distribution, apart from many broader governmental duties. Presently, she's posted as the Secretary, Department of Health and Family Welfare in the government of Chhattisgarh since April 2018 and has been spearheading the fight against the state, the state's fight against COVID-19. Welcome, Ms. Singh.
Great. If we move on to the next slide. So as you all have seen, throughout this weekend, we've been on our journey, starting from the initial 41 pitches that you all had come up with to the conversations that occurred across a variety of Slack channels across multiple time zones, to then the ideation process, meeting with mentors, refining your ideas, going through pulse checks, and finally bring us to where we are today. Again, we're very excited to see what you all have come up with. And with this, we'll briefly provide an overview of the criteria for the judging. So as mentioned before, uh, hackathons, a lot of people traditionally associate with coding. Uh, but in this case, it's not just about your code. Actually, that may not be the most important part. More importantly, it's your holistic solution. Therefore, we look across four primary criteria. Impact, innovation, implementation, and presentation. For impact, remembering that we're here because we're trying to solve real pressing problems. For innovation, why would this work? How can we overcome the inertia that currently exists? For implementation, is the idea that you all have come up with practical? If you all won today, how would you move forward tomorrow? And then finally, presentation. How effective was your presentation? Were you able to communicate the complexity of all that you've learned over this past weekend in three minutes? It's a tall order, but again, it's been great to see the progress that you all have made um, thus far, and uh, we're excited to hear it. So moving into logistics, once we start very shortly, we will be recording the presentations. Uh, we again have suggested that you limit the communication to one or two during the pitch, but when it comes to Q&A in the last two minutes, uh, you're welcome to switch in order uh, for whoever feels most comfortable to address the question. We will uh, please keep your background noise muted and Vikas will be driving forward this presentation and providing a heads up uh, in the chat when you have uh, 30 seconds left. Finally, at the end, when we're done with the session, the judges will move into deliberation where four winners will be selected amongst the teams. And next slide. Uh, so again, for the next team, please raise your hand. For us, this puts you to the top of the Zoom session for us to be able to unmute yourself. And then again, we'll kick off into our three minute uh, presentation that we'll start. We'll give you your warning and then move into our time of Q&A. So first off, we have team 24. Give me one second. I'm trying okay. to figure out. So yes, team 24, if you raise your hand, then we should see you at the top of the Zoom queue. All right. Team 24, your time starts now. Thank you, Matthew. Warm greetings to the respected judges and everyone else who's present here. The name of our project is COVID. Next. Imagine the grief faced by the family of a poor middle-aged man who died of SARS-CoV-2 in Mumbai. He couldn't receive treatment because he was turned away by the hospital. This is the reality in India. We have one doctor for approximately 1,400 people. Below WHO's prescribed norm of having one doctor for every thousand people. Next slide. And this statistic gets worse for other allied health professions. This is more acute for COVID-19 since interventionalists and infection control specialists are few in number. Initially during the pandemic, a national lockdown had been imposed, but due to the lack of planning, management of resources, and the coordination between the government and the private sector, the situation got worse. Next. So how do we approach this? Our solution is a three-step approach. Next, we will collect real-time data to create a centralized inventory and use it as an input to build a machine learning mo model that predicts outbreaks. The inferences from the model can be used to allocate and transport resources. Next, so how does it work? Let me provide some context. Next, we start by reviewing real-time data from mobile health resources. 
This data includes stats about the patient's health, like temperature uh, and oxygen saturation level using sensor-based equipment. Next. To build a central repository for resource management, we will be collecting fr data from various governmental agencies and private suppliers, allowing for micro-scale and macro-scale inventory management. Next. The collected data will be analyzed by epidemiologists who will work with data scientists on predicting the location of the outbreaks. The inferences from the real-time data will help us build a more precise model than existing public repositories. Next. Based on model predictions and demand, we will collaborate with logistic companies to transport and allocate resources. The catch here is that the healthcare institutions can act as clients as well as suppliers. Therefore, the concerned authorities will be prompted using automated systems. Next. This is a value proposition. Our business model will attract investment and funding from various kinds of entities. This will help build a collaborative ecosystem that includes the government for management, mobile health companies for marketing, logistics companies for partnerships, and universities for research opportunities. This kind of research rationalization will be time efficient, cost effective, allowing for the combating of future pandemics as well. Next. Our team consists of software engineers, machine learning scientists, data analysts, medical students, and authors, allowing for a diverse variety of people. As part of our future plans, we wish to focus on the private healthcare sector of India. More than 60% of all hospitals are privately owned and don't fall under a direct authority such as ICMR. Our idea will be able to serve as a web of communication for these private hospitals. Thank you. Great, so at this stage, we'll open it for questions and Vikas, could you please start recording? It's all recorded. Oh, great, awesome. So judges, we'll kick it off to you for any questions for the team. Hi, this is Niharika. I just want to ask you, um, there, there are so many models, epidemiology model and, and such predictions which are there on, on the shelf right now. Why do you think yours is something different? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, ma'am. So uh, the thing uh, which we are focusing on is real-time data. So right now there are many uh, public repositories from which we can fetch the data, but all those data, all that data is underreported. So ours will be. Uh, so what we are focusing on is real-time, real-time tracking. So that could be uh, using, you know, sensor-based thermometers or oximeters to ch monitor the temperature, or uh, there are m uh, other devices like Fitbits which can monitor the heart rate and stuff like that. So we'll be focusing on the real-time data so that in advance, we can get to know the hospital or the COVID care facility. It can be prepared accordingly. I see. Thank okay. Man plus, uh, we are not just a mathematical model. We are something more than that. We provide logistics too, and uh, uh, we, are, we are trying to make an inventory too. And we will use data to uh, aid other organizations too. So we are not just a model. Well, you mentioned that you will be supplying logistics and other things to all hospitals which are uh, probably doing COVID care right now. So uh, if you if you uh, know about the government public sector, there are certain rules and purchases and other things. How would you fit into that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I can take this question. Uh, so the idea is not to purchase inventory and the idea is to map out about the uh, healthcare facilities that are, yeah, yeah. So the idea is to uh, uh, gather supplies from the healthcare institutions where the supplies are more than what they need and is predicted that they will need and provide it to those which have a lack of it. Uh, with, uh, which don't have enough resources, uh, healthcare resources. So our, our idea is to basically uh, make a match between those and uh, and bring in logistic companies to okay. move the inventory from uh, the excess to. Yeah. Okay. We have 32 seconds left for the uh, team 24. 24. Great, so we could take maybe one more Quick question if any of the judges have one more. 
What do you think is the biggest barrier to engagement of the private sector in this uh, solution? So the, maybe I can take that question. So the biggest barrier would be the collaboration, of course. So our data collection would involve suppliers for PPE equipments, suppliers for hospital ventilators, oximeters, and everything. So the main barrier would be to bring them all together in one network, especially also tying up government agencies with private agencies and make them work together as, a, as one system. If we can achieve that, then maybe we'll be able to handle the, such situations much more efficiently and in a better manner. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you, Team 24. We'll now move on to Team 32. And next up, Team 23. So Team 32, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, this is Ashwit of Team ESM and I would like to create an app called Global COVID-19 app. We can use this pandemic to turn the tide and create a revolution in strengthening the coordination across the healthcare institutions and build a robust ecosystem. Next. Problem statement. Does all the medical practitioners get to know about the best treatment methodology related to rare syndromes associated with COVID-19. Next. RAS syndromes is a disease which affects a handful of people around the world. A statistic says about one in a lakh gets affected by a RAR syndrome. Some of such cases related to COVID are multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This is a condition where different body parts can become inflamed including the heart, lungs, kidney, brain, skin, eyes. Over 300 children's, uh, children were affected in US by this disease. Goulian bar syndrome causes abnormal sensation and weakness due to delay in sending signals through the nose. Next. Ideation. So the doctors or physicians share their best treatment method methodologies of such rare syndromes and the nurse practitioners captures the ideas of treating such rare syndromes and the ideas are fed into a centralized database. The panel of experts start their validation check for accuracy and duplication of data. Application develop, an application is developed to access the centralized data. Next. Doctors treating rare syndromes, medical journalists and researchers are ones who provide inputs with proven treatment methodologies. The details are gathered by the panel of experts who validates and stores it in a central database. The end users will be doctors and nurse practitioners and pharmaceutical companies across the world who encounters patients of such rare syndromes. Next. Implementation. Patient with a rare syndrome walks into the hospital. The frontline worker used this app to input the patient's symptoms. The doctor fetches the best treatment methodologies from the application and the doc doctor treats the patient accordingly. Next. Pros of global co-19 app. Reduces doctor's time during pandemic so they can focus on more patients. Improves the recovery rates of patients with rare syndromes. Strengthening coordination across the healthcare institutions. It may be public or private. Right now, to start with, we are working on RAS syndromes related to COVID-19. In future, we will be incorporating RAS syndromes associated with other health issues, such as cancer and brain stroke. Such information such as cha challenges faced by doctor during treatment and how they overcome those challenges. The medications and treatment methodologies used Ongoing research updates of rare syndromes can be ex expected on an application in the future. Next. Ashwat, you're over three minutes. I'm going to pass Thank it on to the questioning now. Judges, go ahead with your questions, please.
Uh, we, the definition of a rare syndrome, of course, is, is uh, implied in that is that um, they're, they're not difficult to identify. How do we know that there are not going to be rare syndromes uh, that we're going to learn about over the next six months related to COVID or long-term consequences? And how will your, pro, how will your solution uh, incorporate that new information moving forward? And I think the so follow-up question would be that the, uh, the way these sy syndromes present in India could be quite different than the way they present in other places. And so perhaps the treatments could be different in different places. So we basically want to diagnose it and show it to the world. And there'll be frequent updates in our application on the rare sy syndromes around the world. I have a question. This is Niharika here. Uh, why have we picked up rare syndrome? You know, COVID is affecting the entire spectrum of uh, diseases. It uh, affects people with hypertension, diabetes, cancer. Why rare syndrome? Do you have data in India how many patients with rare syndrome been affected by COVID? Mom, actually, uh... Yes, to recognize a person affected by COVID with a rare syndrome, it's a bit difficult. So that's why we have invented this app and about one lakh around India has rare syndromes in COVID. Uh, well, uh, what I think, you know, uh, first we have to identify whether the disease is, whether the infection is COVID. The rare syndrome comes later probably, but first whether it is COVID, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any last questions? Thank you. From... All right. Thank you, Aswat. We'll move on to the next team, team 23. And team 01, you are next after 23, so be ready. Team 23, your time starts now. Team 23, you ready? Team 23, are you on? Yeah. One minute, sir. Okay. Are you ready to start? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, and uh, our idea is basically based on the problems in ambulance service across the country, especially in remote area. Does it become a major problem? And these are the and um, these are the uh, examples due to the problems of ambulance service in India. As we can see that the thirty percent of deaths are caused due to delay in ambulance service. People are losing lives, people are suffering due to the improper ambulance service in India. And these are the examples of ambulance, uh, means improper ambulance services in India. And also 20% uh, of emergency patients are deaths were caused by traffic sounds. This is also a, uh, another, means another reason uh, is uh, ambulance service. And these are the uh, basic uh, requirements uh, for, uh, for our system to implement. And uh, so our plan is to provide a platform uh, connecting with the uh, national helpline. And this um, and this system consists of a vehicle and driver, basic ambulance equipment, a cell phone, offline gro global addressing system. Uh, this system uh, is basically useful for the area having uh, poor networks. And one of the base example is uh, what three words. It will provide uh, accurate uh, uh, location even uh, in uh, offline condition and um, and this uh, and this is how we will we work and these are the procedures the patient call uh, the patient call to the ambulance service the ambulance sends a notification to the general liner the car is the patient to the uh, hospital and this is the means uh, this is the flow, flow chart, uh, how it works okay uh, suppose the patient uh, 
uh, patient uh, calls, then the address has been recorded through the offline global address system. And, uh, and, and that system will see the, what are the vehicles are available within the locality. And these are the vehicles out of which uh, vehicle one, vehicle three, and vehicle five are not available at that time. Only vehicle two and vehicle four are available, but out of it, the uh, uh, vehicle four is uh, nearer to uh, to the patient. So the vehicle four will take the patient to the hospital. And this is how our system works. And uh, thank you and have a nice day. That is questions for twenty three. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, this is basically sort of an Uber system that picks up the patient and takes them yes, to the closest place. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. So this is basically taking a patient to the closest facility, which is very important. But what if that patient cannot go to a private or public, uh, to a private hospital and they need to go to a public one, then wouldn't they be diverted to a different place? Uh, I mean, how would you do that? Because not everyone would be able to go to a public one and not everyone would go to a private one. So would you sort it out as to where they're going or how would you do that practically? Or would you just take them to the closest place? Is that what you're working on? Ma'am, uh, at least nearby can help the patient. The nearby people which is available at that time, they can at least help so that uh, they can at least get the uh, means a good fame and that's it. Oh, what I've been constantly hearing, and what I've been constantly hearing that when people don't get the ambulance on time, they hire a private vehicle. They pay, yes. They're paying for that. Because right. they don't get the uh, they don't get the ambulance on time and it is necessary for them to uh, uh, means it is in that time they must have to hire the private vehicle so our system will help them to save time because when they call the private vehicle it also uh, does delay to reach their home so it is basically a solution to that. But how would you know if the patient had COVID or was calling the ambulance for some other reason? How does this help the COVID challenge? Sorry, could you hear my question? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah, actually, when the patient calls, uh, call, means calls our service, then uh, it's not necessary that we only uh, means carry the COVID patient, but okay. means uh, uh, but means right now the COVID patients are more uh, in the locality or something. Means COVID nineteen is the that the patient could have this disease. So when he means observe the symptoms of COVID or something, then he can call or then we will pick him up. No, because if he's if the patient is short of breath, how would you know whether it's because of their having an asthma attack, a COVID attack, or whether it's from heart disease or anything else? Would you pick them up anyway and take them to the nearest COVID facility or an emergency room, or what would you do? It would be hard to answer this question, and we have to move on. We okay. Are over time. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Niharika here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I also thought as much that this has no link to COVID challenge one. Number two, the National Ambulance Services right now, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, prevalent in many states, sponsored by National Health Mission, suggests the same thing. So I don't see anything innovative in this. In many states, we have the same ambulance system based on the GPS system where the caller calls, the call center picks up and sends the nearest available ambulances to the public uh, health facilities. The presentation doesn't tell me whether this facility is public or private and how will they make distinction where to take the person. 
and who will bear the cost of this, whether it's the government sponsor or it is a citizen's program run by some private system, it is not very clear on that. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, please. Yes. Oh, actually, uh, when the patient just briefly, means, we'll, we'll uh, give you just like uh, Uber. Hello. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. You, you have thirty to forty-five seconds to address the question. If there's anything you'd like to respond to, otherwise, we need to move on to the next one. So, go ahead and provide a response if you'd like. Okay, just like Uber means uh, we set up a destination. So here also we will ask the patient then where he he wants to go. Means he wants to go to a public public. Uh, hospital or a I means private hospital and will uh, means will pay uh, fees him means he have to pay accordingly means if you go to public uh, public hospital then uh, it will be some uh, means government will pay some uh, some percentage and if he goes to private then he have to pay the full fees actually ma'am uh... yes Actually, ma'am, in this case, uh, in the metro cities or in the towns, it has been already developed. We are mainly focusing on the rural areas where the service is not adequate. We are actually uh, focusing on rural areas because we need not to solve this problem in the uh, metro areas or the developed areas. So mainly our our target is to focus on the rural areas where people are suffering due to the lack, due to the delay of ambulance. Because I have I've been constantly to hearing. Thank you, Team 24. We're going to have to move on to the next team. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Team 001, you ready? Yes. Yes, oh. we're ready. Go ahead. So, yeah. next, please. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Pranav, representing the Team White Walkers. Before we begin, I need to tell you why we signed up for the hackathon this weekend. So last month, three of my relatives contracted COVID-19. No one in their community showed any symptoms, and hence the community was totally unprepared to handle this. One fine week, they were admitted to the hospital for breathing issues, and a week later, mother, father, and daughter all dead. Next slide. It's not just my family. My team members and all citizens of the world have seen preventable deaths proving that we still can't effectively track COVID-19 today, and it follows that we can't predict a resurgence in the future. We're in the midst of this tough situation where we're always running after the virus instead of staying ahead of it. It's destroying our healthcare and economy and any collaboration between any institutions. Next slide. So we present to you a solution that gives us hope in these troubling times that we can actually turn this tide around. Based on by census to track COVID for better collaboration across healthcare institutions. Next slide. Before we go further, why wastewater monitoring? Uh, next slide. Because we are able to track the virus anywhere and anytime through a community-focused, fully automated and real-time approach that is sustainable for all future viruses. The presence of COVID-19 in fecal matter is well established, proven by MIT's very own BioBot group, who observed SARS-CoV-2 from RT-PCR tests in the sewage pipes of USA and publications in Lancet 2020, confirming that even asymptomatic patients shed the virus. Next slide. By utilizing biosensors, we are foregoing many of the difficulties of lab testing on wastewater, including mass mobilization of workers, risk of exposure, the delay in results, and as well as lab tests being an expensive resource. Next slide. Here's the schematic of a wastewater biosensor. It collects sewage samples from the sewage line, filters and prepares it for the biosensor, and the output signal is communicated with the cloud using a centralized IoT network. The entire process is fully automated and doesn't require any human intervention. Next slide. Zooming out, the biosensor network helps provide real-time open source data about risk-prone communities to public and private healthcare institutions. They use this data for better allocation of PPE, test kits, doctors, and ICU beds, as well as for smart lockdowns and opening up local economies. Next slide. After testing the finished prototype in Chennai in our proposed timeline, we would be expanding the biosensor network to major metro cities. We would go, go ahead with the data analysis and inferences, and we would share the useful data across healthcare institutions, both public and private, improving allocation of doctors and ICU beds to risk prone areas and establishing essential lines of collaboration between the two sectors. We estimate the running cost of the biosensor to be around 75 US dollars per month. Next slide. We want to transform India into a pandemic prepared world leader for the future. India could create the sewage monitoring infrastructure today instead of importing the technology tomorrow, saving thousands of lives in the next phase of the pandemic. Next slide. 
In conclusion, join hands with us in laying the foundations towards better healthcare collaboration now and in the future. Let's track COVID-19. Thank you so much for your time and we're very happy to take questions from the esteemed panel. Go ahead with your questions, Dejas. Thank you. What kind of tests do you propose from the fecal matters? We will be uh, using optical biosensors uh, to perform RNA DNA hybridization in the same way that it occurs in the RT PCR, except we'll be using a bio biosensor chip that is that can be ejected out of the biosensor uh, when it reaches saturation, which would be around 30 days. So we are detecting viral RNA. Sorry, had to add that. Okay. Well, what, what would you detect? E gene, N gene, or what is that you will be detecting in the fecal matter? Um, we've seen through uh, cutting edge research that's happening lately that uh, all all uh, the the N N one to N three genes have proven to be useful biomarkers in uh, for, to present in the wastewater, and we could capture. Uh, we could capture them, yes, we could. Do you have a technology for this? We, we don't have a prototype yet because we, we found this idea and we thought that it's incredible that, uh, that there was a quote that we came across, which is very telling. In, in one liter of sewage water, there's an ocean of information. And we thought it's, it, it, that it would be a great complement to the current methods of testing, to test wastewater monitoring, to do wastewater monitoring as well. Okay. Uh, my question is about how do you determine uh, when you detect this virus in the wastewater, how do you determine uh, how much virus is in the community from that detection and how do you determine when it occurred? Because people can shed virus even for many weeks, the True. RNA. Um, so how do, you, how do you track this over time, determine where, uh, where the epidemic is, is uh, most prevalent? So, uh, the in the timeline of the pandemic, which is uh, around two months in, is when we find the useful biomarkers after isolating the RNA. So once uh, once we are about once we scale scale up the biosensor network and we establish all the biosensors, we 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 would take around two more two more months to set it up. So by that time, we predict that there will be there there'll be many regions which are further ahead in the COVID process. So uh, we we wish to use the data that we get to perform a qualitative analysis uh, comparing one region to another in terms of the uh, severity of RNA present per sample over a week or a week's period, uh, which is being shown to be the time period that a person consistently sheds uh, the, the virus once they have it. And a good thing. And a good thing here is that this is also quantitative. So as soon as the uh, effective measures are put in in motion, like uh, an effective vaccination, for example, we can track the response. It's not only about predicting the disease and taking charge of the pandemic, but it's also understanding if our measures are actually working. Exactly. Any last questions from, from judges? Otherwise we'll move to the team 37. Right. Thank you, team. We'll move on to the uh, 037 now, Isa Yog. The time starts now. Yes. Yeah. So, respective judges, uh, this is our portal eSIO, which relates to interlinking of healthcare units in India. Next, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. The pro sorry, the previous slide. So, the current problem in India is that uh, there is no centralized real time repository that maps the demand and supply of healthcare facility. And this is happening on two fronts. First, for the citizens, there is no transparency on availability of beds in which hospitals, because of which they either end up with a compromised quality of infrastructure or they end up paying a higher cost. And for higher and for healthcare units, there is no, uh, there is no pro uh, a possibility to share its infrastructure between itself or for that matter procure it from the third party providers. Next please. Moving on to the business model, 
uh, we have determined that our customers would be citizens of the country, the suppliers and the healthcare units. We uh, move on to a revenue stream, which is which would be a subscription-based charge, wherein we'll be charging a flat fee to the hospitals and zero fee to the uh, citizens. Initially, we would be providing the availability of beds to citizens as well as sharing the infrastructure. Going ahead, we would be doing a lot of forecasting using big data and, uh, and would be encapsulating even the niche players. Next, please. Our uh, operating model is based on, first of all, uh, mapping the healthcare units and third-party providers to the PIN codes. Next, please. So here is where the ESIO, which is means of the corporation, comes in as an open portal, leveraging the geo mapping using the PIN codes and AIML to bridge the gap between the demand and the supply. The main, the, the main aim is to ensure the easy access, cost, effectiveness, and the flexibility while increasing the patient coverage and reducing the human effort. So here you can see a dashboard which has the overall bed management. What are the requests which are coming up with, with, the, with the different patients? Next, please. Uh, so for a particular hospital, it is important to know what are the different requests which are coming from patients, what are the categories, and the, the demands for the different kinds of beds. So here we are proposing uh, the, uh, the, the, the forecasting model for the few uh, upcoming months, so the hospitals may be well prepared uh, with, the, with the availability of the resources. Also, they are talking about the system log. So in, in case of hospital to hospital, if they want to transfer or share some resources, they can do that. With the with the new requests which are coming up with thanks next so here we present the e sayog mitra which is nothing but a chatbot where a patient can actually interact with the chatbot and uh, they can ask what are the different hospitals which are uh, near to me and maybe it is covid or non covid hospital and then the chatbot can assist next once i know what are the hospitals available near to my location i might need to know what are the bed availability with that particular hospital. That also I can get it. Also, the cost for that particular resources also been suggested by the chatbot. Next. You guys are 10 seconds over. Uh, we can have the, the booking scheme at the end um, and the reference number will be provided. Next. So basically, our value proposition is that our solution addresses the gaps present in the current healthcare system by making sure that we uh, make available of service and empower the citizens. We have to stop yeah. you here. You are 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll pass it on to judges for questions. Panel, please uh, start with your questions. Any questions from the panel? Yeah, this is Anil. Uh, one quick question. Um, you said that uh, uh, your it's based on your operation model. Actually, has been these tested? Uh, has this model been tested, or uh, is it a reference? No, sir. Using? It's a reference till now. Uh, I, I'm sorry. This is a reference till now. We will. Uh, we are okay. Going to yeah. Go. Okay. All right. Do you have a reference? Do you know where, where is it coming from? Uh, no, sir. Yeah. So we have made this since there was already a lack of facility like this, a portal and interface where patients can directly get such information before visiting. Uh -huh. the so we have come up with this model now. Okay. So okay. is this? No. Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Is this uh, really meant for just patients who have symptoms or no symptoms but want to get to medical care because? What if they end up needing an ICU bed? Will they know if that hospital has an ICU bed or a plain admission bed? Who would yeah. be making that decision? The patient wouldn't know what type of a bed they need. No, uh -oh. so ma'am, what we are doing is, so uh, if you know that our government in India, various state governments have encouraged daily consultation with doctors. So in case what happens, in case sometimes a patient is said that, okay, you should now visit a hospital. It's high time you go to a hospital now. Right. So in this, what happens is many patients uh, land up at a hospital and then they go get to know that there are no beds available or no resources available. And then they have to go around the city looking for a bed or looking for the yes, resources. Absolutely. So this, yeah. 
Yeah, so this our portal will solve exactly that problem. They can use our portal and get to know which is the nearest hospital which has the required facility. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any last questions from the panel? Okay, we're gonna move on to the team six. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, what team Thank was you that? Very much. What, what team was that? Team 37. That was 37. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are also posting the team numbers and names in the chat if that helps. Okay. Thank you. you. And everyone. Okay, so next is team six, and after that, we'll take team 98. So team six, your time starts now. Hi. We are here with our keyboard card. Meet doctors next. Meet Dr. Sarma. He is a doctor in the private healthcare institution and is focused facing a problems in accessing the past useful record of a patient who is a critical situation. This is because the patient has done his earlier medication in public healthcare institution. Similar problem is faced by Dr. Sinha, who is in public healthcare institution. There is a huge communication gap between both healthcare institutions. Next. There are significant information asymmetry and a lack in communication of necessary data across the public and private healthcare institutions. There is a pressing and time sensitive need to optimize and facilitate the information sharing across public and private healthcare institutions because it poses extra problems for the doctors in this pandemic situation. Next, solution. Our solution is to design a health card to store all types of patients' past record as well as ongoing medication information. The card would store all the information by using the concept of cloud computing and IoT chips. Next. Next slide, please. Anytime, anywhere, and any healthcare institution would be able to share the important data of patients with the help of QCode card. It is consisting of IoT chips and is a form of RFID card connected to Raspberry Pi to store and digitize the data resources. Next. Dr. Sarma came to know about our Q code card and discussed about it with his peers. They found it quite useful as it also connected with web application. They started recommending it to their patients. We have done the market research and found that Health card can be easily made available within rupees 100, which is quite affordable in India. Next. The use of secure QR card, encryption and other cryptography measures make it extremely difficult for unauthorized users to access our information. Hence, it would help in meeting the HIPAA privacy and security requirement. Our value proposition is that QCode card is a secure and even store the information without the presence of internet. Next. The output would be easy information sharing. You are over time. Uh, so we're gonna have to stop you here. You're 30 seconds over. Thank you. I'll pass it on to judges for questioning. Uh, how does this help for the COVID situation? This certainly is very important to share all health care information, but how will it help in a crisis situation for COVID? Because after knowing the different health related informations of the patients, doctors can easily treat the COVID patients. 
because COVID patients require the past records. So doctors can easily share their information with public and private sectors due to the presence of this COVID uh, Q code card. So the comorbid conditions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Hi there, could you, you. Uh, explain a little bit more about how you're proposing to uh, import and, and, and harmonize all the different data sources from the public, private sector, laboratories, pharmacies, there's a lot of different data sources that would presumably need to be integrated and harmonized for this to work. How, how would that be done? This card is like a card which is in, integrated with IoT chip, which can store the information even without the presence of internet, like RFID card, and uh, it, uh, its working model uses the Raspberry Pi. And it stores the information on cloud computing and uh, stores it on the web application. Doctors can access it using the web application also. It would be connected to the web application. Therefore, the doctors would be easily integrated with the web application and get, get all kinds of information easily. But how would the information get in into the system? I understand how the how the clinicians and patients could access information once it's in the system. But how would laboratories, for example, and, and pharmacies and multiple hospitals and outpatient centers allow their data to be accessed by this system? For security purposes, it would be further integrated with the Aadhaar card, which is unique for each and every person in India, especially. So there is no any problem for us, and it would also follow the HIPAA uh, guidelines. Hello. So can I answer this question, please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, for example, we use ATM card and for example, we have SIM cards in our phone. Similarly, we can have a vending machine where a person goes and a doctor can, a, a vending machine can be in the hospital. The card is swiped at the vending machine and any information that is to be transmitted to the card that is being fetched to the vending machine through pen drive or any through a digital medium like I transport from my computer. And as soon as the data gets into vending machine, it would be stored on that person's card. As a verification method, that uh, data goes on to that person's card only. We are using the Aadhaar card authentication. For example, uh, in India, you can use the Aadhaar card to get the payment out of it Sim by just using the fingerprint. Similarly, uh, fingerprint would be also be enabled in it. And after a, uh, after in wording, uh, vending machine, you swipe the card, you uh, place your finger and it gets a verification, yeah, it's you. Then we can, then the data can be transferred person's data can be transferred into the card. And now when you will go to the next institution, healthcare institution, the same healthcare institution can swipe your card, get your authentication, and all your previous data would be available. Similarly, thank now you. for, yeah, yep. Thank you for all the, for your presentation and answering the questions. We're gonna to have to move to the next team now. Team 98, you are up. Ready to start? Yeah. Okay, your time starts now. Good morning, Boston, and good evening, India. We are the lads, and we're going to present about the COVID care management system. The next slide. The next slide uh, depicts the disturbing news about the unavailability of beds to COVID patients and the inability of hospitals to treat the people with medical emergencies, as most doctors are involved treating the COVID-related patients. In the next slide, we can observe a contrasting situation where the gross mismatch between the healthcare delivery and utilization can be seen. The next slide, please. Uh, in the right, <laughs> we have the Indians who do not, um, in, we have the urban Indians who do not visit hospitals, though they have lots of hospitals in urban areas until they are critically ill, fearing that they may get infected with COVID. And in the left of this image, we have the healthcare center in one of the rural parts uh, where there is insufficient resources to treat the patients. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, the development of a robust unified po portal for pooling of resources and treatment of patients by merging the private and public sector under one treatment and a one cost scheme is a solution that we are pitching. Next, Next slide. slide. 
Our main idea is to isolate the COVID-19 management system, CMS, from the mainstream healthcare system. In this system, the cost would be regulated and the resources are pooled to ensure the availability so that everyone has equal access to medical treatment despite the financial constraints. The main benefit of the system would be that it would reduce the overcrowding at hospitals and thereby reducing the burden on the healthcare system while regulating the cost for everyone. Next slide, Next slide please. Upon testing COVID positive, the details of the patient come to the system through the authority. The patient is then picked up from their home, that is door to door pick up and drop. The system then randomly allots the nearest and the most suitable healthcare facility to the patient by keeping into account the patient needs. The patient is then treated for COVID-19 and the facility in the facility and upon testing negative, the patient is discharged. Next slide. The CMS, which is the COVID care management system, helps benefits the people, the healthcare worker, hospitals and in and the country as well. It benefits by uh, like overcrowding is avoided and the responsibility is evenly shared. It helps in early flattening of the curve and reduction in the COVID-19 mortality rate. Next slide. A similar system called as the RNTCP was followed to control the TB outbreak during the early 90s, where all the hospitals, irrespective of being public or private, were unified and as one and under a 100% centrally funded program. This is very effective till today in controlling the TB. And as we, ex uh, we also expect the CMS uh, caters the need of the R. In the next slide, uh, we, we find the most important part, that is the implementation, where we, find, we, where we aim to f uh, pool all the resources available so as to ensure even distribution throughout the country and form a separate governing body to ensure smooth working. And all of these are brought under one robust umbrella, that is the CMSs. And this will also in, uh, ensure that the ho whole uh, system, the healthcare system works efficaciously. In the next slides, uh, we also have uh, depicted the workflow of the whole uh, system by the means of uh, uh, apps, which are also depicted in the next slides by use of K and N algorithms. Next slide. Uh, you can please go to the next slide. Please move, keep moving. Yeah, this is our team. Uh, it is a quite diverse team with, from people from both India and China. And also in the next slide, uh, the, the next slide. Uh, this is some of the reviews, uh, ground reviews that were conducted from doctors uh, from various parts of country and what they think about the system. Thank you. Thank you, team. You are three, 30 seconds over. So I will now invite our judges to put their questions. Hmm. Any questions from the panel? Uh, thank you. The, uh, the RNTCP program, uh, as you mentioned, has been quite effective, but one of the challenges has been it's worked quite well in integrating the, the public sector, but less well with the private sector. And how would your, how would your proposal overcome some of those issues? I will take up this question, sir. Actually, even in RNTCP, it is under a broad under control of the government, sir. It's not a description between the private and public sector. It is a own self-governing body which treats every person irrespective of his financial status. So if the virus do doesn't have a boundary between rich or poor, then why the system or health system have a boundary between the public and private sector? That's why we are trying to give a notion or a concept of merging the private sector and public sector, not entirely. Just the COVID care facility provided, provided by the private sector to get integrated into a common umbrella and pool. Then our technical team of COVID care management system will deal with all the randomization that occurs. One more thing is that we strongly propose of randomization. It is not up to the, the ball is in ball is not in the court of the patient that he should go to a particular hospital. The, the program will set up a randomized based upon his own, better than his own option to go into a particular, particular hospital. That is our notion and a concept and idea. And the most important point here is that we are trying to uniform, uh, uniformly give the treatment to everyone so that the cost is also uniform irrespective of it being a public uh, facility or a private facility. And also by doing this, we are uh, going to separate only a portion of all the doctors available so that they will only handle this COVID. So the reminder of the doctors are available to treat the people who are having other illnesses and emergencies. And we also showed in the first slide, like so many Indians have been, uh, have died or had, did not get the facility because the hospital were full. So we are just trying to avoid the situation. In simple sentence, non-COVID care will be tremendous. Non-COVID patients and non-COVID healthcare professions will be much benefited from this.
Are there more questions from the panel? Thank you, Team 98. We'll move on to Team 13 now. Yeah, I'm ready. Can you hear me well? Yeah, go ahead. Your time starts now. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm representing Clean Team 13 Cloud Supply. Next, please. Uh, we are uh, tackling next, yeah, uh, no testing due to health facilities in coordination. Next, please. Next, slide. yeah. And the validation we did through this uh, chart, where we can see the India is on the bottom of the pyramid. And although the number of testing is increasing, it's below the global standard. Next, next please. So the current system is cumbersome, bureaucratic, and disconnected. Next, please. Uh, and the problem we are trying to solve is through blockchain technology, which will improve a coordination at the same time it reduce the next piece. Uh, in the first phase, we will create a uh, network of private healthcare facilities, and then uh, and next uh, and then we'll create a public network, and then we'll combine it together to provide the operational side. We would create a dashboard, and a uh, and in the next phase, we would move from testing to personal protection equipments and face masks. Next, please. Uh, to explain things, uh, if in case uh, there is a healthcare facility which is running out of test kits, they can reach out and can identify the neighboring test healthcare facility which might have additional tests. So they can loan those test kits. Uh, over a period of time, we will find a real time need analysis of rapid COVID testing and also to find how the needs are arising in that area. Next, please. Uh, for multiple revenue streams, we are trying to. Uh, 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 monetize this advent, uh, this uh, uh, venture through annual registration fee or per transaction fee and subscription model. Next, please. Uh, and to market details, we thought that uh, uh, the annual average cost of COVID test is 2,000 INR in currently in India. We are hitting around 10 lakh tests, so that cal that, cal that calculates to 200 crore total. If we uh, aim at 10% of market in six months, that would be 20 per crore. And if through uh, five percent efficiency we add. That's a saving of one crore per day, and we charge five percent for those charge uh, savings. That would be five lakh INR per day as a revenue for the system. Uh, next, please. Uh, we will be scaling it up in a phase-wise manner. We will start from the state and go national, and maybe uh, if things go well, uh, well, uh, we will go international. Uh, part of the Revenue would be used to generate the supply system in the rural areas of the country. Also. Next, please. Why us? Because we have two years of real world experience of using blockchain. We are a multinational team, and the scaling up is not only possible in India, but is also possible in high burden countries. And the next step of what we are aiming at is to do a sort of a pilot at a district level so that we can get real world experience, uh, find the pain points that we might not have covered and then scale it up based on the feedback. Uh, next please. And we have a team member from Peru, Honduras, uh, and we both are from India. So th that's what we are trying to solve. We are trying to solve this uh, pain point of coordination using the modern technology in a most uh, democratic and transparent way. Uh, that's it from my side. Happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll invite panel to the end of the questioning. This is Anil. Uh, what could be the biggest challenge uh, working on blockchain across the globe? Uh, the biggest challenge is novelty of this uh, technology. We know that there are some companies in India they are using. In fact, there are some logistic companies who are using it, but we haven't found anyone trying to use it in a healthcare system. Healthcare system is precarious in the way that uh, the data is very uh, precious and uh, life depends on it. So that's why we want to try at a smaller scale at a district level and iron out the real world challenges and that we could go up. So the novelty of the technology itself would be an uh, exciting factor. At the, at the same time, it can be a limiting factor to generate trust in those people who want to give it a try. So they might be using a health sector in India for sure, but maybe not in COVID-19. That's what you're trying to say? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I would like, like to add one more point that uh, 
we were we were initially thinking of machine learning and deep learning models to predict our data but um, lives are dependent on our prediction so we we re- uh, re- went to a more reliable technology called uh, blockchain sure thank you correct me if i am wrong this is niharika here what you are trying to solve is that uh, data that is uh, 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 that is compiled through testing um, uh, you know we are trying to solve uh, democratize and transfer a uh, big transparency to the inventory so there might be healthcare systems in the same city like i'm from varanasi there might be different hospitals who would have testing kits at different numbers there might be a rush of a patients to one facility and they might be running out of it so the next possible option would be to order those tests and that might take time but in case they have a neighboring healthcare facility who might have access or have some reserve so they can loan it from them for time being and uh, that would provide so every healthcare facility is consuming test kits but can also be supplier for the other healthcare facility who might be running out of it. in the time being because that's the need of the time to test it and test it as soon as possible well i doubt that is the real problem because most of the testing facilities are run by the public sector and some by the private sector and the public sectors actually know where what is already available because they are all linked through the icmr database there's the icmr portal where all the uh, available inventory is there and we know where what is available so even if you... it is available like to uh, send the material we'll need some communication between the centers right that is why we are using this technology right now icmr supplies to all all we on a real time basis we tell them what is where lacking and they sell, send it to us or send it to our central go down and then we provide to all we are on a real time network to know which laboratory has what and what it doesn't have yeah so, basically we were thinking of localizing it like in the local community suppose uh, an hospital is near uh, nearby not to the go downs and stuff but a hospital can donate to another hospital if it has a surplus of resources and all that okay okay thank you team 13 and we thank will you. now move to team thank you this is my code bandits are you guys ready yes sir uh, good evening judges we are team code bandits uh, can you please move to the first slide please so we are developing a resource management system we are team code bandits and next slide please next uh, so this is the team next so why we, why are we working on this problem so a few weeks back uh, we all got to know about a terrible incident a young man lost his father because he wasn't able to find a bed during this covid crisis time so we decided what role we as technologists can play in all this so what is the problem the lack of man- management and coordination among various hospitals whether government or private and government is other government institutions regarding beds pps and the various medicines like tabiflu and remdesivir leading to sub- suboptimal use of resources and the information should be available to the public not all the information but some information for sure next so this is the covid 19 starts and this uh, shows have a and we would definitely have to learn to live with the pandemic next so what is the proposed solution so we are proposing a common web portal for hospital inventory and resource sharing system the public access of information about available resources at the district level so not all the data would be available to the public and there would be different levels of data that would be available whether to hospitals or to public and data visualization would be there to make sense of the collected data we this will be a government operated platform basically and all we need is a server to actually make this possible and it would be mandatory for hospitals to enter data here to get all the hospitals on a common platform next so this is a quick walk through can you please play the video 
so this is the home page here you can see where the beds are available and you can search according to the city these are the live starts available through the charts and this is a login page this is the hospital interface and you can go to the admin site to enter the data dynamically and the graphs also get uh, updated dynamically and all the data is uh, saved here only so this was a quick proof of concept and here we can see that the data has been updated next so uh, these would be the groups that would be benefited from this platform uh, the hospitals may be government or private general public and the government administration next so this is our implementation plan the first step would be to uh, collect the data from all the hospitals and make them come on one platform so then there will be a pilot run with the help of uh, district administration subsequently we launch it on state or country level and then there will be public and private resource request system on the basis of their feedback for example there is a government uh, institution which has a surplus of uh, some uh, beds or some kind of medicines or anything during emergency situations that a public hospital that is also handling the situation requires so there will be a process for that next the ho hospital administration will have to change and add the data constantly after logging into their hospital interface next yeah we'll stop you here we'll have to stop you here uh, you are 50 seconds over I'll invite the panel for the questioning now. Hi, this is Niharika here. Uh, well, uh, before developing this, have you studied what is already available with the state governments as well as uh, with central government? There is something called NHP, National Health Portal, where a lot of data of what is where is recorded each state-wise. Apart from that, a lot of states have a lot of, have you analyzed what is already there? Uh, yes, ma'am. We went through the Punjab government website and we found that the district level coordination is uh, not particularly possible there. And we couldn't see the hospital side platform there. I think that would not be available to the general public. So that is what we saw district level uh, website certainly there, but uh, some all districts don't have the resources to maintain that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, any other state that you have seen? No, ma'am. We have seen for Punjab only. Okay. Any more questions from the panel? Okay, I'll take that as no, and then move to the team 15. So I'm sorry, what was the team number? 98? It Bandits. was uh, teammates, sir. Teammates. Team, 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 team 08, Code Bandits. Thank you. And I, I also keep posting the names in the chat if that helps as we sure. go. Okay, team 015, the time starts now. Hello everyone, we are Team Co-Connect and we are here to connect, collaborate and conquer COVID-19 and beyond. Next. Do you know that India has seen an upsurge of COVID-19 cases in its rural parts? To add on to that, we are facing a substantial shortage of specialized healthcare facilities. Next. The numbers suggest that there, there is a stark contrast of healthcare distribution between rural and urban areas. For 67% of rural population, there are only 33 doctors uh, available. Next. Let us now travel to a remote village in Uttar Pradesh where Dr. Meera aims to cure her patients. However, she lacks the specialized know-how to deal with the diverse uh, symptoms of COVID-19. What could she probably do in such a scenario? Refer complex cases to a bigger Hospital. Next. Introducing COVID, uh, Co, Co Connect, a mobile platform that offers consul consulting to doctors like Mira who are based in a rural setup. Next. 
CoConnect categorizes rural cases as per their severity in a triad system, allocates them to the relevant specialists from the public and private healthcare, and supports them via calls, messages, and video, video conferencing with specialists. Next. We stand for empowering rural healthcare workers to timely and effective manage, manage their cases and reduce the spread of virus by minimizing the movement of patients um, for, to seek treatment. Next. So as for our business model, our key partners would be the government and private hospitals. Our proposed model reduces the cost, increases access and availability, optimizes time, thus saving lives. We propose that the public-private parties negotiate average price range for, their co for the COVID treatment. Next. Looking at the current market, we have uh, Grameen Healthcare and a joint venture of government, Karnataka government uh, working with Apollo Clinic. However, we set ourselves apart from both of them in terms of direct primary healthcare sector and promoting a public-private partnership. Next. Uh, moving ahead, our uh, roadmap for QCO Connect is uh, to onboard our primary users by the end of September, and we are planning to release our MVP by January 2021. Also, uh, also we will uh, be further relooking at the post-COVID strategies for our platform by expanding our outreach to ASHA and Anganwadi workers for other prevalent diseases. Next. CoConnect is a scalable pan-India uh, platform, bridges the knowledge gap between uh, primary healthcare sectors and and uh, specialist centers and also cost efficient. Next. So we are team co-connect and we are here to the rescue of Dr. Mira and such. Thank you everyone. I now invite the panels for their questions. Yes, um, thank you. Would you uh, say a bit more about your business model and how the public and private rural hospitals would be paying for the services of the consultants that I presume this, this is a consulting service. How, how would that actually the, work? The uh, negotiated cost structure would vary depending on the speciality involved. So um, some would require, if there is an emergency case and they're, uh, trans they have to be transported to uh, a specialist care unit, the cost will be uh, an average cost which um, the pool of uh, investment can afford. So this sh the, the cost will be a part of their partnership agreement with the public-private partners. And uh, the investment model would include um, the, uh, the uh, investments from the private entities as well as the government um, aid. What would be the incentive for these hospitals and stakeholders to pay for this? Because it would increase the cost, of course, and presumably improve the care. But, but how, how, would, um, how would that extra cost be covered? Um, our pitch is that um, the government has an, a vested interest in a, a public welfare and public uh, hospitals being big corporations are, uh, are uh, required to invest 2% of their profit margin into CSR, so corporate social responsibility. And in a time such as this, nothing more than COVID can be a better social cause. Thank you. You you mentioned consultation. Uh, how how what is the method of consultation? Will, will it be a teleconsultation? Um, we're looking at uh, tele teleconsultation via uh, so the data of the patients can be uploaded on the on a, on a Co Connect as a portal, and uh, the in, the specialist can have a look at. Uh, basic information about the patient that, that can be recorded at the local hospital and uh, it will give them uh, either by prescription or by a video conference with the local doctor. It's a B2B service where the doctors can collaborate and come up with a treatment uh, which is of the nature that will help the patient. Are you, are you suggesting a hub and spoke model where the doctors, consultant, specialist will be in a hub and the rural areas can connect to the hub or are you talking about individual consultants sitting at the clinics or home and then giving consultation? 
as of now, the project uh, only aims at local doctors at one end, the, uh, local rural government doctors at one end, and private uh, corporations, uh, uh, private healthcare corporations on the other end. So we're looking for engagement of some um, pu uh, public health, uh, private healthcare consultants as um, workforce that can be included in the module. So what, what kind of patients they can take is just uh, asymptomatic, mildly symptomatic, or they can also uh, consult for the severe and moderately severe patients. Uh, Ma'am, I would like to uh, address that question by saying that uh, whichever kind of patient comes towards the uh, local of the local end, uh, at least the doctor will be able to consult a specialist at that particular time. Uh, so our main aim is to uh, give them the specialized uh, care that they require at the time, clinical guidelines and training. So which will go a long way in uh, improving the rural healthcare system. Later on, if they need to refer the patient. Uh, which can be done. Uh, if the, our main aim is to uh, prevent the transport of patients uh, if, as much as possible. And whatever can be tr uh, done at the local level will be done, along with a specialized uh, uh, doctor looking after them. Thank so you, what team. is the technology platform they will be using? We're looking at a mobile app or a web-based platform. So uh, we're assuming that uh, each rural unit will have a minimum geo-enabled uh, or uh, internet network that uh, they can use for the uh, technology that's involved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Team 15. We're going to move it along. Next team, Team 4. Yeah, hi. All right, team four, you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. The time starts now. Go ahead. Hi, we are presenting our product, Kobe Cloud, which aims to provide a hassle-free and efficient experience for all patients who want to get admitted for COVID care by bringing the private and public healthcare institutions in our ecosystem and providing dynamic and real-time updates about the hospital facilities to the public. Next slide. I work at AIMS, India's Apex COVID Care Center, and patients are getting admitted here every day from various socioeconomic strata with unique problems like lack of access to smartphones, internet connectivities, and transport, which prevents them to know which hospitals have vacancies at that very moment. Next slide. And it's just not my patients in Delhi, but this problem, as you can see, is everywhere. And the patients are dying each day due to lack of timely care. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah, one second. Yeah. So this is our solution. It's a platform which provides our key stakeholders, the helpless patients, access to all the relevant information required to get admitted. Next slide. And this is the interface of our digital application. And using our portal, patients can make informed healthcare decisions and also reserve a bed at a private institution by accessing data about their facilities real time and also by considering the cost. They can also connect with healthcare representatives and volunteers and necessary ancillary facilities. Next slide. And the most unique feature of our platform, which has tremendous public health potential, is that we provide native language support to our digital users. And our platform is also accessible by the non-smartphone users via a toll-free number and the patient's USSD feature. Now, Shreya will continue. Next, Next slide, slide, please. Here's a visual representation of the competition, right? To draw a comparison, we have taken Arugya Setu app, Delhi Corona, and Swast apps that have a wide user base. As you can see, most of the features that we offer are not currently in use, and hence this is our main focus. Next. About the business aspect of our platform, after doing our market research, here's a 
clear breakdown of expenditures as software development, operations, and other expenses. We have opted for the blended revenue approach where majority of our revenue is based on in-app ads, a portion from the services fee from private hospitals and also inclusive of other miscellaneous sources and intermediate stakeholders. Next, please. This is our roadmap. The POC is a well-researched user and reach access data. The business aspect includes the launch and software development at stage one, reaching a net profit at stage two, Stage three would be scaling up. Our current product includes the start version with real time data as mentioned before. And as we progress, different specialities would be added and ultimately reaching out to telemedicines and doctors as a product. Next slide, please. This is our team and we are from a professionally diverse background with expertise from all domains in order to implement the business. Next, please. This is just a glimpse of our network that we can reach out to for support in making Kovi Cloud a reality. Thank yep. you. We're going to stop you here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But I would like to invite the panel for their questions. I think you could switch back to the team slide, please. Thank you. Any questions from the panel? And no questions from the panels? We'll move on to the next team. Thank you. Uh, Niharika here. Essentially, yes, you are giving information. You are giving information to the patient re regarding the hospitals, the cost involved, and then giving them an option to take pick up any hospital. Is it it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, uh, how is it different from the other thing that that such uh, apps or such technology which are already there in the market? Ma'am, uh, the key uh, unique feature of our application is the accessibility. Like we are uh, reaching out to uh, the rural areas and the places where digital connectivity has not been there yet, as well as we are providing an alternative mean like a toll free number and to use the USSD feature of the very simple feature phones, which a lot of our patients have. And uh, I think that is our the most unique feature and till now, I haven't seen any other competition uh, or a probable competition having uh, this feature in their product. Okay. And it's a two-way process. You're also connecting the hospital. The hospital also gives his consent to take the patient? Yeah. Unless so, that is uh, then once... the patient will just reach the hospital and not find uh, uh, the willingness of the hospital to take the patient. How, how does no, that... We are, we are enrolling the hospitals who are interested okay. because we are providing a whole new uh, patient base to the hospitals from these mm -hmm. uh, rural areas who might be financially independent and maybe able to uh, afford the kind of care but they are unable to do so because they do not know that this particular hospital has a vacant bed right now. And uh, that is uh, a very uh, big business opportunity for the healthcare providers who are enrolling for our platform. An incentive for them for thank investing you. in. Yeah, thank you. Any further questions from the panel? Take that as a no, and then we move to the next team, F31, Team Enigma. Are you guys ready? We're good. You can begin. Your time starts now. Okay, uh, this slide, okay. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Pranod from uh, Team Enigma, and we are combating how private, charge, uh, private hospitals overcharge for, uh, for treatment uh, for COVID patients. Next. Um, so what is the issue? One of, so the issue that we noticed was private, uh, private hospitals were charging more than the government mandate. There exists a government mandate uh, that says that hospitals, private and government, are allowed to charge only a certain amount. Uh, amount and uh, private hospitals are either unwell 
or they are, they are willfully charging more than the cap uh, price. Next. So, uh, so, so who, uh, why are we the best people to solve this? I was personally COVID positive and we spent about two days haggling over uh, during the discharge process with the, because the hospital was unaware about how to discharge me with regard to where they would get the money from and all of that. And they had built a whole lot of stuff that wasn't uh, required. So, uh, so this impacts the lower strata of the society as well. The lack of awareness about amenities available to the lower strata of the society shouldn't be why somebody has to forfeit their life savings when there is other alternatives. Next. So the target audience is um, the Bamanali zone in Bangalore, Karnataka, in India. So I work out of the COVID, uh, I work out of the COVID war zone in Bamanali right now. And we're targeting the lower middle class people, especially people that end up going to uh, hospitals with very little money. Um, and uh, the private hospitals within the Bamanali zone that are unaware, these would be our immediate target audience. We aim to get through them through radio, newspaper, SMS blast, and through social media. Next. So our solution is to come up with a price calculator where we help the public make, uh, come up with a rough estimates on their own based on the government mandate as to how much they can expect to be charged. This is only an estimate and it's not a definite amount. So we would also be providing the government mandate so that the citizens would be able to go through the information themselves. We would also be completing the feedback loop using the support. Um, we would also be providing support information. Next. So this is uh, this is the website that we have built at the moment. Um, so depending on this, we'll be showing what the pricing uh, for uh, different categories of bed in different hospitals are. This information is coming directly from the uh, uh, from the government mandate uh, uh, from the government uh, mandate. So you have you have a field where you put in how many days you were hospitalized for, and depending on what bed you were hospitalized for. Uh, what bed you were allocated, you would be able to come up with a estimate of how much you would be charged. Next. So how does it help? Uh, so this reduces price gouging by private hospitals that take advantage of the growing of those people because they have no idea as to how much they'd be charged. Um, this would provide people awareness and it would also help uh, organize the public and uh, private networks from uh, support organizations. Uh, patients that do go to these uh, hospitals independently, they would also have an estimate as to how much they'd be charged for and that way they don't get blindsided. Next. So our implementation plan, uh, so in the Womanali zone, you know, we have about 85, uh, 85 uh, private institutions out of which most of them are PHCs. We have, uh, we have, we have a whole, uh, we have a lot more hospitals and we have one uh, war room out of which we operate out of. We have uh, we have a website that's ready. It's not live yet, but um, it's, it's going to go. Live. Are Fifty minutes over. I have to stop you here. Oh, sorry, fifty seconds over. I have to stop you here. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I'll invite the panel for their questions now. Is it an app-based solution? Um, no, ma'am, it's not an app-based solution. It's a website where people can go in and plug in their numbers. And based on that, they get a rough estimate of how much they'd be charged. It's not an app. It's a website. Okay. But uh, what about how long they'd be admitted? Because sometimes they may go thinking that they're going to get, you know, three days and they end up spending 12 days in an ICU. And um, then will they be able to afford that once they enter? So for people that are below poverty line, or even uh, people that uh, are above poverty line that cannot afford these amenities, there is a government scheme called the SAS scheme. So anybody that's unable to afford it, it can go through the scheme. And even through this scheme, there is, uh, so there is a, a certain slab that the hospitals are supposed to charge. Even, even though they are not, uh, so once they go into the hospital, they won't know how much they're gonna be charged right off the bat. But when they're exiting, uh, during the whole discharge process, the hospitals have been known to add uh, a slab. When I got discharged, there was a flat, uh, flat 60,000 uh, additional uh, termed as COVID treatment that was added to my bill. Um, currently, if anybody saw anything like that, they would be empaneled. So, um, so yeah, hospitals are trying to rip people off. And by, um, you know, by making this entire information accessible, 
we'd, we'd be able to ensure that citizens are able to, you know, know how much they'd be paying. And if there is a situation where they're going to be charged a whole lot more, they can escalate it to us. Thank you. Uh, Great. Do we have any more questions? All right. I will take that as no and uh, move along to the, in the interest of time, we'll move along to the team. Thank zero, you. Zero. Uh, hello? Sir, it's F002, uh, zero, zero if I'm not wrong. Yeah, it's F002. Zero, zero Read it as F002. Zero, zero uh, sorry, there's an error on the screen, but the team is F002. Zero, zero yeah. Your time starts now. Go ahead, please. Right. We're in Tracer and we'll revolutionize contact tracing and sanitization forever. Here's how. Next. Vinod and Rashi have a contact tracing app on their device. Next. Both go to the market and once back, Rashi receives a message on her app uh, saying contacted a COVID positive person. Now both get tested and it turns out that Rashi was COVID negative. Surprisingly though, Vinod was tested positive, maybe because he came in contact with someone who had a potential COVID risk, but his app didn't show that. You see, the problem with existing solutions is that they only trace confirmed COVID cases, not the potential risks. And since COVID status is manually updated even at the databases, so it is prone to human error. Next, that's where we come into the picture. We have a device which scans an ID, checks the temperature, measures the SpO2, sends data to the server and also sanitizes the person. Uh, we have a server which logs details, uh, creates multiple firewall encrypted databases for institutions and data is privacy protected because we aren't using any personal data. Uh, and we have an app which traces contacts and collects details from the server. The magic here being that based upon the SpO2 and the thermal reading that uh, based upon the SpO2 and thermal reading, we determine if the person is a high risk or a low risk individual. Next please. So here's a flow diagram to help you digest the things better. Okay, next. So what's the use then? So in Tracer enables governments and local authorities to segregate areas of high risk, change bed capacities in hospitals and ramp up testing. Besides that to the private market, it allows for easy integration of data monitoring into any existing HRMS with the Intracer API. Next. So talking about the competition. So Intracer subdues most of the competition and ranks higher in terms of features and accuracy based upon all of these metrics that is up at your screens right now. Uh, it's very different from Google and Apple solution because A, it's hardware based and B, we aren't using any private data. Next, next please. So who is Intracer for? So Intracer for is built for all of these, uh, all of these categories up at your screen right now, especially for institutions and offices, the total number being 26.1 million in India alone. Uh, can we move ahead with the next one? How many would Intracer impact? So Intracer would impact about 125 million people. Most importantly, 37.4 million people studying in those 39,000 institutions and about 40 million retail workers working in the formal industry. Next. Uh, speaking of numbers, Entracer is bound to break even in a month with the ROI of over 600% in the first financial year, selling at one third the price of a regular automated sanitization device. Uh, please go ahead. Next one. And we have a three year sales forecast to back those numbers. Uh, next please. So far, we have built the prototype app with the dummy data for representation, the 3D model for the device, the schematic and PCB design for the circuitry as well. Uh, can we go ahead uh, to the next one? That brings us to our roadmap. So starting with rapid, proto uh, rapid prototyping and testing in month minus one, we aim to capture about 1% of the market share at the end of FY2. Meanwhile, expanding our target audience and production at, uh, at all of our areas of influence. And finally, next one, please. Behind and Tracer is a team of four engineers who believe in creating impact before something else impacts us, period. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, this is Anil. Uh, uh, how uh, cost effective it's going to be and how uh, are you going to face the challenges which you come across? Right, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your question first. So uh, in, in, uh, when we talk about cost effectiveness of the machine itself, so we did a cost, uh, cost to customer. So per sanitization and sensing for every person, it's only going to cost 2.5 rupee for the institution or the organization that's installing the device. And that is taking into account the initial cost of the device that they'd be paying for as well. 
How would the sanitation, what type of sanitation are you talking about? How would that work? Sanitizing who or what? Right. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll explain the entire scenario. So there's a gateway. A person enters the gateway, scans the ID card. His thermal and SpO2 readings are taken by the machine itself. Post, it is computed by the server. Sanitizer liquid falls down on his hand and then he's allowed entry inside the gateway. That is the whole purpose of the sanitization aspect of the thing. And so this is uh, some sort of a return to work screening, automated screening program yes, sir. that okay. adds a SpO2. Well, um, since yes, up to 50% of people are asymptomatic, and even those who are symptomatic, very, very few of them will have a low SpO2 or a high fever. Yeah. Uh, they may have, uh, the, I'm just a little bit unclear about how effective you think this will be given that it may only pick up 20% or less of the COVID positive people coming through the door? That's, 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 uh, that's a very good question, sir. But then again, uh, it comes upon, uh, it, it, it becomes a question of how mature is the database. So once we have the databases running for about a month or so, we have, we'd be collecting so much of data that in future, even if the percentages of the person who uh, would be detecting just 20%. So on the basis of historical data, we could actually predict what would be the number of people who have, who are in, uh, who are in the possibility of a high COVID risk during that time. So then again, it's a question of the maturity of the database with time, the database will get mature and it'll be able to predict the same. Um, I still don't understand the sanitization. What is it you, you sanitize their hands when they walk in? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, so I'll, uh, the, the but cost... many, many places now insist that everybody sanitizes their hands before they walk in. So why would this be better or more important in terms of screening? Ma'am, since it powers, since it powers the contact tracing application, which is a direct rival to other competitors like Aruki Setu, which work on human man, human, uh, uh, updated data. So right. whatever data we are collecting through the device that is being used by the app. So the main goal for the device is to collect the data. The sanitization is only the secondary aspect of it. And then what do you do with that data? So, uh, take for example, you come in contact with another person and uh, mm -hmm. you come in contact with another person. His, uh, ID pops up on your screen. You can click on the ID. You can check the location of contact. You can check the time of contact. You can check his SPO2 and thermal data along with whether he's at a higher risk or a lower risk. This data comes from the machine. Thank you. Respected okay. Now move along to the next team. Okay. Can I just old. ask a quick question? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. You See, you, your entire database is useful when you juxtapose it against the database of the positive patients. Right. Then you know that those who came into contact there, whether they were positive or not. Where do you get those databases, the positive patients database? Absolutely, absolutely. So ma'am- Who uh, will give you that? Yes ma'am. So the API is capable of running on multiple databases at a time. So apart from just taking, collecting the data from the machine, we could also in future uh, rely on a secondary database which as mentioned, the current database that is being used by Arogi Situ is highly ineffective and inaccurate. So once- No, uh, no, no, sorry, sorry. Let me, let me just say, Arogi Setu is a government of India uh, app. So they have access to the ICMR database. Yes, ma'am. Right, uh, those who turn positive ICMR database gives it, feeds it to the uh, Arogi Setu. From right. where you will get the data? From the machine. Who will give you the data? Yeah, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be getting the initial uh, risk data from the machine. And for the confirmation, as I, as I already mentioned to you, there are a lot of open source APIs that are available in the country, which provide the same data or about 99% accurate data or in future, if uh, there's hello? even hello? more robust. APIs, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think the uh, patient privacy is involved. No database will give you the name of the person who is positive. Ma'am, we're working on the IDs rather than uh, the names. So even the database that uh, Arogi City works upon, it uh, returns us a JSON string, which sends us the ID of the patient rather than his name. Thank you, judges and the team in Tracer. We will have to now move along. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll invite the next team, uh, team 027. I have 027, Dijima. Uh, yeah. Hello, am I able? Yes, you are. And yeah. you can now. Um, okay. Good evening or morning to the esteemed panel of judges here. It is a pleasure to pitch a project called Digima, Digital Plasma. Next slide, please. 
So before we start, why plasma, right? As we know, the liquid part of blood that is collected from patients who have recovered from COVID-19 is called convalescent plasma, and the treatment to cure COVID-19 is called con uh, convalescent plasma therapy. This is a this is a real life resident who has been rejected by several hospitals for the last few days to get the blood plasma for um for his 43 year old cousin who's critically ill with COVID-19. Imagine if he had an app where he entered a few details and was immediately notified of the donor present near him at the time. What would have happened then? Um, next slide, please. Well, the problem lies in key uh, four key areas: time. Firstly, time. People are uncertain about the availability of plasma donors in hospitals and spend days in finding available plasma banks. Um, second, accessibility. Daily, we are seeing limited amount of donors coming in. However, we are still not able to cater to all the demands due to the high surge in cases said by the head of the blood transfusion department at ILBS in New Delhi. This shows that the communication between plasma banks and the users is just not there yet. Costing. Users have to pay thousands of rupees due to lack of user information on availability of different donors in different localities. Eligibility. Donors between the ages of 18 to 60 years um, and who have no symptoms for 14 days and are tested negative for COVID-19 are eligible to donate their plasma. But data coordination needed by institutions to find the donors is causing delays. Next slide, please. Um, so the solution has um, four key steps. Um, firstly, the donors fill their details and check for av availability. Dijima updates their COVID test results from the ICMR database. Users provide their blood group and zip code. And Dijima finally uh, connects them together at the nearest hospital. So the government will fund this because this will connect the public and private healthcare institutions and increase the probability of matches between users and donors. Consumers will uh, use this essentially to find a donor in 15 to 20 seconds um, instead of more than a day as currently. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a prototype created of our application. In the middle, the uh, donor enters details like uh, blood group to check for his or her eligibility to donate. The donor is then immediately entered in, in the system and known to the hospital. Next, on the left, the user inputs the, the zip code and blood group. And finally, on the right, the user is mapped to a donor nearby. To shed some light, have we implemented? Uh, we are using a highly sec secured SQL database for storing down our donors data and use geofencing to prepare the data beforehand when the user enters into the application. So we have a pool prepared for the nearby donors in the cache. We are pre-processing and segregating the data based on zip code and blood group. As you can see, so to minimize the number of data calls. Next slide, please. The idea of the system is to take advantage of the common data by the government of the public and the private healthcare institution. The pool of donor, which is eligible by our filtering system will be sent to both public and private institution. This would in turn increase the probability of finding match between the donor and user since now we are involving both the sectors. Next slide, please. Just to name few of our competitors include Hyderabad's Donate Plasma, Delhi Plasma Bank, Lions Club Blood Bank. When we compared to our competitors, there is a high level of coordination in our system and within seconds donors are going to be available and recipients will be uh, recipients find their match. Dijima performs IVR using Twilio to verify donors so that we can be in constant touch with our user. Dijima aims to connect the pool of donors and recipients between both public and sectors. Next slide, please. So these are our team members of varied experience yeah, for marketing. Your, um, team, I'm going to have to stop you. You're 40 seconds over. Yeah. So yeah, we are open to questions now. That's all. Just go to the next slide. We open to questions. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, these are, I presume you're talking about giving convalescent plasma to people with suspected COVID. Is that correct? Right. Yes. So uh, the challenge we have, of course, is that uh, we know two things about plasma right now. Number one, that you have to give, to have a benefit, you have to give plasma very, very quickly after symptoms within three days of onset of symptoms to have maximum benefit. And secondly, that the plasma that you donate has to have a, what's called a high antibody titer to have greater effect on, on outcome. So um, the challenge is also that the antibody titers to, in people that are infected go down after a few months. So real-time donation is a challenge. It's better that in the long term to store high titer plasma and get that rapidly to patients rather than call donors in real time. Um, I'm just a little curious about the logistics of this and how you're going to optimize the clinical benefit. Um, okay, so um, yeah. I'll yeah, answer it. So, 
Yeah, so uh, basically, um, uh, for uh, to extract it in real time, um, we are uh, we are taking most of the pre-processing in backend, and we are pre-executing many queries in the um, database itself. Um, so the turnaround uh, time that we expect is minimum, uh, like um, around fifteen to twenty seconds. And if this grows up, uh, we have thought of it, and we can scale it by adding more resources in it. Um, and um, also, we are um, using like master uh, tables and sub tables, and in that uh, we'll have middle and upper layers, uh, which will not change the application or the user experience. So basically, uh, now coming to uh, coming to your question, why we are choosing it, to, uh, choosing to extract data in real time. So many of the patients, as we have noticed, uh, the problem is that um, uh, the problem is of time. So um, once um, a user is directed COVID nineteen, he wants to find a donor um, as uh, as fast as possible. And um, currently, it's taking more than one or two days to detect the same. And through the solution, we uh, plan on effectively. Are reaching to donors as soon as possible, and also um, looking at the locality um, in terms of the locality of the users. Yeah. Just to follow up, a donor is only going to be a good donor if um, yes, that donor yes. has high tie titer, or is, um, you know, by the time the donors waited three or four months, they're no longer a good donor. Um, yes. So um, our our data is also accessing the eligibility of the uh, donors. So we are asking them, um, like um, as you might be knowing. The, uh, our target audience for the donors are the ones who um, are uh, who have passed 14 days and have uh, recovered from COVID-19, and after 14 days they still don't show any symptoms. So those are the people we'll be looking for, and we have uh, we are um, asking them the days they have uh, from that uh, from that they have recovered and um, their age based on their eligibility. So what we are doing is uh, we have an automated system. We have an IVR call placed. So for example, uh, we are taking the statistics of patient whether he has covid or not multiple times so whatever the latest statistics have been entered in the system that is verified by the icmr database because icmr has all the records what we need so we can get it verified and whatever the latest statistics we have then we can compute uh, the 14 days after uh, after the onset and uh, yeah. uh, let's wrap this question up here uh, any last questions from the panel before we move to the next team Are, are you putting this in the hands of patients to decide where the closest donor is, or are you putting this in the hands of medical practitioners to decide who is a good candidate for plasma? Um, yes, so um, we are basing it off of two um, things. Firstly, it's age. So only uh, between 18 to 60 years, can you uh, are you eligible to donate plasma? And also, once you have recovered from COVID-19, you need to pass 14 days without symptoms, and only then are you eligible to donate this plasma. So we'll be using this data to analyze and we are not uh, putting it uh, for the users. It's um, for the app and for the practitioners to decide um, uh, uh, for the same. So basically the institutions will take care of it. They have the, uh, they will decide how to reach the donors as well as the patient. Yeah. And two things that we are doing is that firstly, we are taking the load off of institutions to detect eligible donors. Plus, we are sending this data together to both private and public centers because, as you might be knowing, um, like uh, I mean that if a patient goes to private hospital for a plasma therapy, but the public hospitals have the local data of available donors, their blood groups, and eligibility in the ICMR database, and yes, private institutions also have it, but it is um, highly limited. So we are trying to create a coordination between them, which is what the track aims at. Yeah, the reachability is a factor where. Not everyone is able to reach, uh, not every patient is able to reach the possible plasma donors. So we are trying to reach everyone, every donor that, uh, we have in our system. Thank you, Team Dejima. Thank you for Thank your you. presentation. Thank you. And we will now move to our final team, Team F001, Mad Ledger. You guys ready? Yeah, uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you are. And you may begin. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wafiq, and I'm a part of Team Medledger. And today, I'd like to present what we've been working on for the past two days. So I'm actually a Langerhans cell histiocytosis patient. Uh, it's a type of blood cancer. And I've personally experienced so many delays in my treatment last year due to a lack of transparency and insight into the hospital process. As the current pandemic is similarly stressing hospital resources, I wanted to solve that issue. And that's where the idea for Medledger came from. Uh, next. There is... There is definitely a need for a more efficient system due to the continuous surge in COVID-19 cases, which is modeled in the graph and table where the blue numbers are the projected number of cases. This is exactly what Medledger provides. Next. Uh, next. 
Uh, Metalledger utilizes VLT blockchain technology to help potential patients easily see the nearest available hospitals that can provide adequate care for them. It also helps private and public hospitals review and manage their supply chain in a unified ecosystem. Next. So the currently existing inventory management system is what we'd like to integrate our system into. So inventory in our current plan refers to a stock of resources dealing with bringing down mortality such as beds and ventilators. Next. So there is a centralized server that stores data and the DLT forces the data to be encrypted and rechecked on every chain. And the metadata for all of this is also recorded throughout. Hospitals in a sharing network can choose to display their data to people outside the ecosystem as and when they like. Next. So when the user visits the web app, they are greeted with a, web, with a very simple location selector which can automatically also be set using GPS. And this reveals the hospitals near them and their vacancies. Next. Meanwhile, the hospital inventory administrators are able to log in directly into their hospital's database and manage their inventory in a very easy to use selection menu that next. So that begs the question, what do we offer that sets us apart from all the other proprietary systems out there? The main focus for us is on the benefit of the patient. Our unified database allows patients to have a real-time view of the capacity of nearby hospitals. The transparent and secure nature of MedLedger builds greater trust in the institution. As there has been a demonstration in the in inadequacy of current proprietary systems to handle situations such as the current pandemic, there are definite benefits to private and public institutions in this regard, as they can collaborate and uh, they advertise their common affiliations with MedLedger which will increase confidence among potential patients. Next. So we're planning on implementing MedLedger on a hospital by hospital basis with an opt-in strategy for the healthcare provider. After a partnership is set in stone, we will prepare MedLedger to interface using an API with their existing inventory management system to be ready to pull data off of it continuously. Finally, this data about current inventory stocks in each hospital is presented to the end user in an accessible format so that they can make quick decisions regarding their treatment. The main costs associated with adopting our system are related mainly to the server maintenance and the minimal training required to get administrators accustomed to MedLedger's interface. So MedLedger definitely works better the more hospitals there are that have adopted our system. And, as, and it's really as simple as adding new hospitals as new nodes to our currently existing database. Next. I'm gonna have we stop have, you. Yeah, we're gonna have yeah. to stop. Uh, it's just, yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll, 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 I'd like to. Yep, I would like to invite the panel at this time for their questions. Any questions from the panel? I'll take that as a no. Um, and I'll moving, passing over to you, uh, Matthew, for the final wrap up. Thank you. Dr. Goodridge, I saw you on mute. Do you have any questions for them? No? Okay. All right. Um, so the, the final slide is congrats. You've all made it through. Um, as I think we had the conversation with uh, number of our pulse check-ins. You begin this hackathon very excited. Then you are thrilled to work on a new problem. Then you realize this problem is really hard. Spend a lot of time struggling. Hmm, how will we ever do anything to make any meaningful progress? Then if you're able to keep pushing through, focus on your problem, you'll start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so uh, it's been great to see the progress that a lot of you have made from the first meeting all the way till now. Um, and another thing I'd like to emphasize is we hope that this has been very instructive in helping you all realize that you can have great ideas and build this into a solution. So we will be moving into the deliberation soon, but regardless of whether you win or not, we hope that you take this as an opportunity to work on a problem that you're excited and passionate about. All of these partners listed here are there to support you on any of these endeavors. 
So please feel free to reach out, use this workspace as a continued resource to reach out to collaborators. Um, maybe it's not this precise idea. Maybe you pivot and alter it to something slightly different. Uh, but we hope that this serves as a great community for you to spur these innovations in the communities and places where you are. So at this point, we're going to break from this session. Uh, you have your keynote for the participants with Mr. Amitabh Khan at 11.45 a.m. Eastern Time, 9.15 Indian Standard Time. And then we'll move into uh, the winners and the award presentations at 9.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time and noon Eastern Time. Uh, so participants, you are dismissed. Uh, judges, uh, we'll move into a, a break now while we organize and collect all of your scores. So if you have not submitted scores for any teams, please uh, do and submit that now us to calculate. We'll then shoot you all a message on Slack to move into deliberations. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to close this meeting now.